Hey, good day everyone. Welcome to the fourth and final chapter on space and our solar system. My name is Bob Roberts and I'm an aerospace education officer with the Civil Air Patrol here in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. Now this is the fourth chapter and it's going to focus completely on the planets of the solar system. It is based on the aerospace dimensions modules from CAP, but anybody can learn from it. Now, if you might be interested in learning more about the United States Air Force Auxiliary and Civil Air Patrol, you can visit this link up here and it'll take you to GoCivilAirPatrol.com. Okay, so far we have discussed what space actually makes up as well as distant galaxies, our solar systems, the stars, including our sun, and objects such as the moon and the comets. Now in this final video series, we're going to look into the eight planets of our solar system that we all know about as well as the dwarf planets just so that we don't leave Pluto out of the conversation and hurt its feelings. Now this video is going to be very packed with lots of details and it will be in two different parts on YouTube in order to keep the length of the video down and not make you too stressed out trying to remember all of it at once. Now if you are a CAP cadet, you may want to watch these videos a few times over a course of a few days to let your brain kind of absorb all this information. Now you're not gonna to have to know any important vocabulary to memorize for your test like you would with the other chapters. Instead, you're going to need to be able to state some basic facts about the planets. Now, I'm going to do my best to highlight those to make it much easier for you. Now, with that, let's get started by discussing what a planet even is. So, the IAU, which stands for the International Astronomical Union, defines a planet based on three different criteria. It's a celestial body that is in orbit around the sun, and at one, they have to orbit the sun. Two, has enough mass to define its own self-gravity. Basically, it's pulling in with enough force to make it round over time. And three, it clears the path around the sun of any of its neighboring material. Basically, it doesn't share its orbit with anybody else. As mentioned above, we currently know about eight planets that meet the definition, as well as some smaller dwarf planets. There is a search going on for additional planets in our solar system. You may have heard of Planet X that may or may not exist. But for now, we will stick to just the eight that we know about. So, we will now start with the planets that are closest to the sun, and then we're going to move outward from the farthest from the sun. So that means we're going to start with Mercury. Now Mercury is the closest planet to the sun, but it's also not right next to it. Some people think it's like right butting up next to it. It's not. It's 0.39 AU. Now remember that an AU is the measured distance from the sun to the Earth. So Mercury is at the 39% mark for the distance between the sun and the Earth. Now many folks do think it's a lot closer to that, but it's not. Now Mercury completes its orbit around the sun in the least amount of days, at just 88 days. Now Mercury is actually also pretty small. It's only slightly larger than the Earth's moon. There are other moons in our solar system that are actually larger than Mercury, but they don't count as planets because they orbit a larger planet instead of developing their own orbit around the sun. Now speaking of moons, Mercury does not have any moons. It is a rocky planet like the other four you know, inner planets, and it's cratered from the impacts of space rocks. And that actually makes Mercury look very similar to the moon. Now, current, the current thought is that Mercury has an iron core and that there is no atmosphere. Although there is some very slight traces of helium and hydrogen, the temperature on Mercury goes from 800 degrees Fahrenheit in daylight and minus 300 degrees in darkness. Now, we started getting these nice pictures of Mercury in 1974, the year before I was born, from the Mariner spacecraft when it had three different flybys. Then in 2008, we got more recent data from another probe called MESSENGER, which has also made three flybys. But then in 2011, the MESSENGER spacecraft was actually able to successfully develop an orbit around Mercury, and has been sending us lots of great information since. So that's Mercury, now let's move on to Venus. Now in the aerospace community, we spend a lot of time talking about Mars. We send probes there all the time, we want to send humans there in the next generation or two, but it's actually Venus that is actually the closest planet we have to Earth. It's closest in the size, and its distance. It's at 0.7 AU and takes 225 days to complete its orbit. Although it is almost twice as far as Mercury is from the sun, it is actually our hottest planet on the solar system. And that's why we don't talk about it as much as we compare it to Mars. Now, our technology just currently doesn't work in its atmosphere for very long. It gets hotter than 850 degrees Fahrenheit, and the planet revolves around its axis very slowly compared to the Earth, with one revolution taking actually longer than a complete orbit around the Sun. It takes 243 days to complete one revolution. 
This means that the same side of the planet stays pointed at the sun for relatively long periods of time before finally revolving away. Now, unlike Mercury with no atmosphere, Venus has a very dense atmosphere. But the atmosphere on Venus moves much faster than that. It rotates around Venus at an incredible once every four days. So think about the clouds. The clouds are moving around once every four days. It's made up of about 96% carbon dioxide and 4% nitrogen. Now, if you've ever heard about the dangers of global warming on our planet, it's largely due to carbon dioxide, which acts to trap heat like a blanket would to keep you warm. Now, our air contains only 0.04% carbon dioxide, so Venus's thermal blanket is much thicker than ours. It's one of the main reasons why the planet is also the hottest planet in our entire solar system. Also, because of this thick thermal blanket of CO2, the speed at which the atmosphere rotates around the planet the planet's temperature is very uniform. The surface is also smooth and hot, like a big hot desert, due to the large atmosphere and high winds basically rubbing the surface smooth. Now because the planet is the closest to ours, we can actually see it the best. Now depending on where you live, you can often even see this planet in the daytime if you know where you're gonna be looking. Now once you see it, you'll find it really easily. You won't be able to not see it in the future. Kind of a cool thing, it makes you feel a little bit more connected to our solar system. Now also given how close the planet is to us, we actually have been able to send probes to it. Now Japan actually sent the Akatsuki, which means dawn probe, and it monitors the climate in great detail. Now they did have some issues with the probe when it tried to enter the Venus's orbit, but through some brilliant engineering, they were able to get some use of the attitude control thrusters, and they did a 20 minute burn that did actually finally get the spacecraft to orbit Venus in the year 2015 which is pretty recent. So this actually made it the very first climate monitoring probe that we would use to monitor climate on another planet. Now the third planet in the solar system is ours. The Earth is where we call home. It's 1 AU uh, because it's 93 million miles, because 1 AU is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. That takes about a little longer than 365 days, and that extra day, we count that as a leap year. That's why once every four years, we add an extra day. Now, the Earth revolves around its axis once every 24 hours, which makes us spinning around the axis at over 1,000 miles per hour. The Earth is tilted at 23 and a half degrees, and because of that tilt, the Earth experiences different amounts of sunlight at different spots on the planet at different points of its orbit around the Sun. This is what causes the seasons and why we can go from relatively cold winters to relatively hot summers. But compared to other planets in our solar system, our heat is pretty balanced, with the extremes being about 150 degrees Fahrenheit apart. Now we did a separate video on the planet Earth and its weather where we talked about the seasons and the equinox. Now the equinox is basically when the north and south poles are perpendicular to the sun. So our equator points right at the sun. Now if you want to learn more about this and how it affects our weather patterns and the atmosphere, there is a video on that right here. Now speaking of the atmosphere, it is made up of 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen with the last percentage comprising of small amounts of argon, carbon dioxide, and some other trace elements. Now, one of the great things that makes our planet incredible is the large amount of surface water that the balanced atmosphere and temperature, as well as our magnetosphere, which protects the planet from the sun's fury. This has given it the conditions to support the life as we know it. So far, as far as we know, there's no other life existing on any other worlds than ours or other solar systems but we are actively searching. Hopefully we'll be doing a video on SETI in the future. Now our planet is nicknamed the pale blue dot. The reason for the sky appearing blue is that although the sun appears white, it's actually a spectrum of all the colors. The blue light spectrum is a short wavelength and the other colors are long wavelengths. Now the shorter blue wavelengths are scattered by the molecules in our atmosphere, and that is why the sky appears blue. Now, the Earth also has something that we haven't seen yet with Mercury and Venus. We now have our first moon in the solar system. Now, in our last video, we did a more detailed conversation of the moon, and you can see that video up here if you would like to learn more. Next, we are moving to our fourth planet and the current darling of our space program. It seems like everyone wants to go to Mars. And in the last few days of making this video, it's been really exciting because the Earth and Mars were in the correct spot to each other to start sending spacecraft to Mars in the most efficient manner. So we have seen spacecraft from Japan, China, licensed by UAE and others, 
all launching towards Mars. Now we have the most probes that have ever landed on Mars, and we have the most missions that are currently planned going to Mars. Not to mention a push to have humans travel to Mars in the not too distant future. Now we know Mars as the red planet due to their rusty appearance from the high iron content in its soil. Mars is also only about one ninth the mass of the Earth, and as such the gravity is about a third of that on Earth. Now Mars is also farther than the Earth, at about 1.5 AU, about 50% farther than the Earth to the Sun. And as such, it has to travel much further to go around. That takes six, about 687 days for the Mars to travel around the Sun. And that means the Earth can actually travel around the Sun about two times for every time that the Earth Mars can travel. Now one area that Mars and Earth are similar is the rotation speed and the tilt of its axis. It has a 25 degree tilt and a 24 hour and 37 minute rotation. The atmosphere is similar to Venus in that it is largely carbon dioxide at 95% and nitrogen at 3%. But unlike Venus, there is very little of those molecules in its atmosphere, so it didn't retain the heat like Venus does. There is some theories, however, that in the past Mars might have had its own magnetosphere, which protected the planet the same as ours. This allowed the planet to retain its atmosphere, and it might have actually been a lot warmer, a lot wetter, and might have been capable of sustaining life. But at some point, the magnetic sphere might have broken down and the sun's cosmic rays and solar winds just pushed the atmosphere off the planet, leaving it as we see it today. Now the planet is relatively cold, but it does have some moderate areas. The surface can reach up to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which would be kind of nice, but it gets down to a chilly minus 130 degrees at night, with an average temperature being minus 80 degrees, as compared to Earth's average of being about 59 degrees. Now some think we might be able to reestablish the atmosphere on Mars and start to warm it back up. Now terraforming is going to allow, or might allow, humans to one day live on the planet as basically a backup in case something really bad happens to the Earth. Now we do think there is a relatively significant amount of water available in the polar ice caps, nothing like the Earth, but enough. And Earth was the first planet we talked about to have a moon, and Mars is going to continue that trend towards more moons the farther we're going to go away from the Sun, because Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. A cool thing about Phobos, though, is that it travels the closest to its planet than any other of the other moons, and the scientists think it would actually crash into Mars in a few million years. But it's important to know that when we talk about these moons, these are moons are very very small compared to our moon. Our moon has a diameter of 3,500 kilometers, but Phobos is only 26 kilometers long and 22 kilometers across. Now marathoners actually run farther in a single race than this moon is big. Deimos is even smaller. Now, as we spoke about earlier, that we have been sending a lot of spacecraft. Two of the relatively recent ones that recently captured the hearts of our planet were Spirit and Opportunity, which became the little rovers that could. Um, they had a really exciting entry into the planet, and they lasted much, much longer than they originally planned for. One of them is just barely hanging on, but eventually their solar panels are going to be covered with the Martian dust, and they're going to go silent, unfortunately. So, now with Mars being wrapped up, we have completed our tour of the inner planets. We are also going to wrap up this video here. I'm going to be publishing the second half of this chapter in just a few days. There's just so much information here that this video might get a little too long. And so I'm going to be publishing that video shortly after this one. And when I do, I'll throw a link to it up here. And this way you'll be able to jump right to it. Now, if you found this video helpful, please hit the subscribe button and hit that like button. Now, if you're a member of CAP, please leave your squadron name down below. And also please share these videos with your members. I do also love keeping track of all the great squadrons that come in and out. That's why I would love to know what squadron you're coming from. With that, I hope to see you for part two of this chapter. Thanks, and I hope you have a great day. We'll talk to you very soon. Bye. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed that video. If you did, please do me a favor, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button if you want to see more content. Up here on the left-hand side, you're going to see another video from our, uh, this playlist. And if you click down here, you're going to see another video on our channel. Hope you guys all have a great day. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.